Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you're listening to us from, watching us, we're really happy to have you today. My name is Chris Otundo. I'm the CEO of Brighter Monday, Kenya. I will share with you in a bit what Brighter Monday Kenya does. Um, but what we hope to do on this Brighter Monday podcast is really inspire job seekers, educate employers and potentially business owners on some of the insights that they can benefit from um, as they navigate the talent landscape. And we will have and continue to have these conversations with industry leaders. Today, I'm very fortunate to have with me three great guests who have illustrious careers spanning many years. And um, I'll, I'll not even try to, to introduce them because I, I might end up biting my lips. And so I'll quickly allow them to introduce themselves. I'll start with the ladies. And so perhaps while there, you can start and just let us know who you work for, what you do, and what has kept you in this industry this long? Sure thing. Yeah. Um, good morning, and thank you for having me, Chris. My name is Waidera Kibiru, also known as the Digital Diva. I had to say that. Um, <laughs> I work for Diageo. I lead the Digital Hub, which is our consumer digital transformation um, initiative for Africa. Right. Um, so covering our key markets in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, and 15 other markets. I've been with Diageo six, seven years now. Uh, prior to that, I was head of media futures at EABL, which basically meant that I was in charge of ensuring our brands connect with consumers efficiently and effectively. What has kept me in this industry for so long, because I have been in marketing, well, 20 plus years, I think. Um, I think it's, um, the, the side of marketing I like is the innovation side of it. Right. So I love experimenting, I love innovating, I love trying new things. Uh, um, especially when we know that consumer behavior may shift from time to time. So how do we innovate to make sure we're still connecting with consumers in a very relevant right. way? Um, I also love working with people. Um, so I've managed teams, big and small, over the years. Um, so I, I just love that whole interaction of being able to mentor, to coach and be coached and be mentored. And I, I believe that's what keeps me in this industry. Thank you. Candy. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Caroline Candy, also known as Candy. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, um, I've been in brand building marketing for about 21 years now. So yeah, so 20, so I guess that's what you mean by illustrious, illustrious and long. Yeah. My goodness. I know, right? <laughs> um, and uh, right now I am the, I've just started my own uh, marketing consulting firm. It's called CK Marketing Coaching. Yay. Yeah. And I've been reading about it and there are many things. I'm a solopreneur, yeah. entrepreneur, right. gigpreneur. I have so many titles, but really excited. Um, and actually why I started my own uh, company is actually based on what I love about um, marketing and why I've been in this, in this industry for so long. Um, I'm really passionate about the craft. I think for me what excites me is the process of coming up with an idea and, and then seeing it actually deliver something tangible to the consumer and to the business. Yeah? There's just something about that process of we want to grow market share by 10%, which means you have to convince X number of people to buy your product. And the whole process of from coming up with the product to how you take it to market, that just for me, that's something that never grows old. Yeah. Every new project is a new challenge. So um, that's, I think, the best part of what we do. And, and, and exactly what uh, Radera was saying, to do that, you have to really understand what's going on with your customer, what's evolving, what's shifting, and that's that's always live. It's a it's a growing organism. So, right. really excited to be here. I and can't wait to have the conversation. So thank that we're you. Have. Thank you for coming, and I'll talk to you, all of you, about why and how we we, we we're connected with CK. Karibu, Joe. Karibu sana. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joel Rao. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Dentsu Digital Brands. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of Africa Creative Agency, which is an entertainment-based company. Um, I have been fortunate to have worked in the industry for the past 14 years now. Jeez, I am, I'm getting old. <laughs> um, what keeps me passionate about you know, being in this industry is the fact that 
Uh, first and foremost, it's ever changing. Mm -hmm. Since I joined uh, till now, a lot of things have changed. But what really remains consistent is the needs that the consumer has. Um, over and over, the behaviors might change, but the needs still remain the same. Uh, and for me, what really drives me and keeps me awake is the needs that brands have to be able to actually grow their businesses. Uh, but more importantly, um, for me, convincing a consumer to make a decision that they had not uh, planned to make a decision on um, and seeing that aha moment click in them is really what brings joy to me generally. Fantastic. Yeah. So once again, um, today we're in episode two, you're our second um, guests or second lot of guests. We had another episode uh, that focused on, on e-commerce. So today we'll be focusing on marketing, the function. And um, what you might have noticed is that we have with us representation from in-house marketers as well as outsourced marketers, i.e. agency. And so we're hoping to get that contrast and perhaps understand better any differences that might, may exist. Um, this particular episode is sponsored by Marketing Society of Kenya. We've also partnered with CK Marketing Coaching and Writer Monday Kenya. Um, to deliver this particular episode. And we look forward to working with you, um, Kendi, um, as we continue to inspire the next generation of marketers. So perhaps just to kick us off, um, I, I was actually fascinated in preparing for this particular podcast because I thought marketing was very simple, but uh, it turns out it's not as simple as I thought. Um, there's, it's actually very complicated in my estimate. There's almost, over 20, 20 different titles. And um, I guess the, the question is then, what is the value of marketing for an organization? Why should they actually invest in a marketing function? And, um, and, 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 and therefore, then the roles will emerge. But, but Kendi, perhaps you can help us understand, why should a business owner be concerned with having a, a marketing function? So I think, and one of the privileges I've had is I was, I've been trained in, in organizations. So I started my career at Unilever was a Diageo at some point, and Safaricom later. And for all those brands, uh, the consumer is at the heart of what the business is, mm. right? Because, and, I, and you know, I, I keep saying, when you think about why um, you must understand your consumer, and it's consumer-led growth, is because if you want to grow as a business, um, you can have your strategy and you say financially, these are the projections of where we want to go. But unless you understand how you're going to understand the needs of your customer, of your target audience, and then how do you influence their behavior and perception? That's where the growth comes from. So um, I think when you look at it like that, um, marketing then therefore, or let me call it brand building and marketing is where the, is the custodian of the customer, right? And understanding what the customer needs now and what the customer needs into the future. So, so that's, that's why you need a, a strategic role within your team that is driving what we're calling brand. Mm -hmm. Then once you understand that and you're very clear about what it is that you're solving for, then it becomes very easy to say, this is then the product that we need to make, mm -hmm. or this is the optimizations you need to, that's where your product development comes in right. and your R&D. Um, that's when you know, this is how we take it to market. That is now how you package yeah. it to go to your customer. So I think, you know, uh, for me, it's exactly that. It has to be strategic. Mm. And, it's, and it's a strategic part of understanding how to drive growth. Right. And one of my pet peeves is, is when uh, marketing is just seen as an executional arm of the business. Right. Yeah, I don't a cost center. Think. A cost center, exactly. Yeah, it, it's actually a revenue center Yeah, uh, in many yeah. cases. Yeah. And we were talking about this earlier and saying <clears throat> there's marketing and then there's communications. And again, depending on the organization. So I think for a lot of the audience, especially job seekers, they're not too sure what the distinction is. So where does communication come into this? this um... If I could jump in, yeah, sure. know, just to piggyback off what Kenny <coughs> said, let's go back to the basic principles of marketing, the four Ps. Mm. And if you understand that, so there's price, product, promotion, placement, which is your distribution. Right. So promotion is the advertising communication side that we see. Right. But I, I read somewhere, it's probably like, Eight to twelve percent of what a marketer, a does. true marketer, does. Mm. The rest is making sure you price properly. Is your product available? Are you innovating your product? Are you distributed well? 
that takes you know more time than even that's probably 80 percent of what a marketer does right. and that's why it's so important that marketing is it is the strategic engine engine of the business because now for promotion you're for um placement distribution you're working with with a sales team yeah. for product you're working with you know you're if you're in manufacturing a manufacturing team or whatever it is your product is mm -hmm. um if it's pricing you're working with your finance team with your you know you're getting the intelligence to understand What's the best way to price my product mm -hmm. in the market? So, yeah, interesting. But then, over, if how you yeah, know? just uh, and so therefore, and from a role's perspective, as a marketing person, you're the project lead, mm -hmm. right? Because you're again, you're the custodian of what the customer needs. Then you have different team members who are going to execute. You're not going to be the one who's going to create the product. There's somebody else who's going to do that. Yeah. But you're working as a team. Right. You're not the one who's going to sell and make sure that it's place. You're going to work with a sales team. But then the one area that now we own, so as in addition to being the project lead and where you're the person who's also executing is now in the communication, right. uh, the promotion. Right. And that's why the, the, sometimes it's misunderstood because that's where you're leading and that's where you're, you're right. executing to the end. Right. So that's why people sometimes think that that's all marketing is. Right. But the whole job is about really how do you coordinate all these. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Right. And how do you put all these things together yeah. so that you have the right thing? And it's very difficult to communicate something that where, when these other pieces don't fit. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you have a product yeah. that's not great, the worst you can do is market it. Yes. Because it just brings apathy yes. yeah. and it won't deliver the business objective. If you have a, a, a product that's priced wrong, it won't work. So right. it's just, yeah. Right. Okay, then there's obviously well, now that we're clear what, what an organization needs this function mm -hmm. for, then they, then they make the decision to then either in house, in source it to do it internally or to outsource it. And the question is, Joel, at what point do they come to you and why do they come to you? You know, the reason why brands, you know, tend to look at, um, at companies like ours, uh, you know, to fulfill the needs uh, within marketing, I, I look at it in three segments. I look at it uh, from a creative segment where we need to come up with the big creative advertising ideas that would actually promote uh, the brand or the product or the service that you are pushing. Um, there is a media side of things where you know, a lot of business people don't know this, but, you know, close to 80 percent of marketing investments actually go into media, ultimately, mm -hmm. where you, you know, put your billboards, you know, on TV, on digital media. Like that is actually a very big cost center to businesses. Um, and then thirdly, we have what we refer to as customer experience, where after the consumer has heard about the product, they've actually gotten it on shelf. What is the experience of that customer? Mm. Because that is really where the lifetime value of, 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 of any customer mm. you know, comes into play. So it, whenever businesses come to us, they'll come to us within those three uh, segments. Uh, more often than not, you know, what would happen is that there is a need that the business would have, um, you know, they won't have as big of a marketing team that would actually deliver the craft, as Kendi put it. Um, we would then come in to actually fulfill the needs that the businesses would have uh, around that. So generally speaking, um, you know, we are evaluated based off of the outputs that we actually deliver to the yeah, business. And, yeah. and in some instances, we actually held accountable to the business performance that we have. So it's a co-creational effort between the mm -hmm. in-house team and the agency teams that would actually come mm. into play. Yeah. As a business leader, um, does a tension ever exist between the internal teams and the agency? Where... <laughs> <laughs> you had to get right into yeah, it. Right. <laughs> okay, the gloves are off now, I guess. <laughs> because I guess from my experience, I would like perhaps my internal teams to do certain things. There's certain limitations. There's also what the agency perhaps would not understand because they're not sitting with us. Yeah. So how, how does that play out for you guys and perhaps from the guys sitting in-house? What, what then, how, how do you feel sometimes <laughs> when you put it up against the agency? You know, I've had the opportunity to work um, in media and I've worked, the media agency I worked for was also, I mean, I worked in agency, worked in media, and now I'm on client side. And there's a very, you know, we always say this client agency relationship, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, so I've seen both sides. What, I've, what I've, I have understood over the years is um, there has to be an element of trust mm. and a relationship. Because when you trust somebody, you will share with them all the information they need to make the right decision. Mm. And what we see in, 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 in a lot of client side is 
I'm not gonna tell, give the agency all this information because maybe I don't trust what they will do with the information. Mm. Yeah. So then now the agency is working with limited data or information about the consumer or the brand or the business. So the ideas that come are not fully fledged or developed. And then there's a there's a tension. Mm. Oh, my agency doesn't understand me. Mm. And the you know agency says we don't you know. So it's really about building trust and relationships, and that's what we have personally. I have spent a lot of time with the agencies I work with in building that relationship. Because even when you trust your agency and they come to you with a wild idea, you'd be like, you know what, Joe, you have my back. Let's do it. Let's do it. Mm. Let's do it. Yeah. That's it. I think also just to chime in um, before Joel comes on is. I think tension is good. Yeah, yeah. In fact, for me, one of the, the, the signs of whether the relationship is working, whether the partnership is working, where people are bringing in different parts of what you need is if there's tension. So yeah. I don't necessarily see tension between the agency and, and, and brands being an issue. However, I think you know, it has to be productive tension, right? And I feel sometimes half the frustration, um, and I've, I've had the luxury of being on the client side the whole time, so I'm always giving the agencies a hard time. <laughs> uh, but um, I think, you know, it has to be tension that is around the idea and around. So I always challenge yeah. and say, why? If the idea is not making me feel uncomfortable, and if we're just going with things that are not, that I'm comfortable with, when we're comfortable, then there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. We're not pushing the envelope. We're not being creative enough. Um, so I think there's that, there's that bit of actually, how do you, how do you create a space where there's the right tension, but the right tension around the idea? Yeah. And what we're trying to do, because I think the biggest challenge is when the business feels that the agency just doesn't get it, that we, we are under pressure, mm -hmm. right? We have a whole business. They are telling us this marketing money spent, he's talked about, it's an investment. It has to return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing things that are fancy and nice, but they're not giving the return on investment, yeah. then that's a waste of money. Right. So you need your agency partners to own. And I'm also such a big believer in collaboration and owning the outcome together so that whatever ideas were coming with uh, if it works if it doesn't work at least we can we have joint ownership to say hey maybe this is why, why we, we needed to do something different yeah no look just like Madeira, i had the experience of working on the brand side actually i started my career uh in telco ultimately what i came to realize and one of my mentors actually said this to me a long time ago is that people will always want to work with people people want to work with people they like yeah. People want to work with people they trust. Yeah. If I know Kendi is going to, Kendi trusts me to do the right thing, and she mm. gives me the leeway to do the right thing, it's not only in my best interest, it's also in her best interest to actually allow for that to thrive, right? So ultimately, what tends to happen is to, you know, to Widera's point, is that that trust is never built. We never give these relationships time to. Uh, form to norm to storm, you know, build that whole process of, of, of building a team. But I think in, in 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 everything that we do, then it's going to always be underpinned by do I trust you to do the right yeah. thing, right? Mm -hmm. And from an agency perspective, and I, I, I've now over the years that this is my eighth year in agency. One of the things that I realized quite quickly was that um, because I now understand that I want to work with right there because I trust that she will allow me to do what I do best. She believes in my skill set, she believes in my team skill set, in the way we set things up. Then what happens out of that is that the, the challenge that would come through is, please give me more data to be able to do what I need to do. Like, I, I don't want to feel like I'm fighting with one hand tied behind mm. my back and mm. expect me to win the, the fight, right? Mm. Um, and, and, and so it goes a long way that. And, and I think over and above just having the right skill set, it's also just having the right attitude towards mm. human beings. Like, you know, mm. you're a cool human being. I want to, I want to do work with you. Yeah. Mm. And let's do honest. great work. Great work. Yeah. Let's do exactly. great work. At the end of the day. Yeah. So even, even from, um, from a talent perspective, because, you know, we're talking about right on Monday, mm. um, over and above just recruiting for skill set, recruiting for attitude mm. becomes yeah. the most important thing that we look for yeah. ultimately. Yeah. But I just want to chime in, sorry, on, on the skill set, because I think the skill set is an important yes. driver of trust. Mm. I find like one of the most uh, challenging things on both sides is 
if the, there's the, the person on the other side who you're working with, so if I'm in client and I'm working with Joel in agency, if the agency doesn't have the right skill set to deliver for me, that's where a lot of the tension comes. Yeah. So from my experience, for example, if and, 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 and you kind of have to know what your skill set is and what the expectation is uh, on the other side so that, that yin and yang, yeah, so it can work. So I think for me, from my experience, one of the challenges, and we say, let's say we are, you're coming up with a creative um, a campaign. If the agency side, people don't know how to judge. And again, we always talk about marketing. It's the science and the art, right? There's a method to the madness. So if we're looking at this campaign, right? Brita Mandy has put up a campaign on to get, to get people to, onto the platform. What is the science on how we evaluate how this thing is going to work for my business objectives? Does the person on the agency side get it? Does the person on my side get it? If th th that for me is, and I think from a skills perspective, that's what we need to be. So you can have the greatest attitude and I'm all for attitude, but if you're not able to understand how, again, it's always about money, investment, that is supposed to return. How is this investment we are making going to return on the business? And then therefore, what are the skill sets at the, on the agency side that are required to do that? And what are the skill sets um, on, the, on, the, on the marketing side? I feel like the privilege that, and I, my dear, I think I can speak to this, the privilege I've had, Diageo, Unilever, is we used to do a lot of in-house training. And there was a lot of programs, you know? Uh, you know, Unilever, there was marketing, Unilever is called the University of Marketing, right? Marketing Foundation. You know, Diageo, there's Dweeb. Yeah, and, uh, brand, building. brand building. So all those things help you build that capability. And the beauty with that training is it's done, you do it and you do it with your agency. So the whole time you're constantly, and you're speaking of the same hymn sheet. The challenge I think most people have is your agency is on some certain principles and working with something else. You guys are on certain, so you're not, that, that cohesion isn't happening. So that when you come now to actually evaluate the work and to say, is this work delivering for us? That's where there's attention. Yeah, so two things, if you don't mind. For um, so job seekers, you might have different views, but I'm curious to hear. Looking back, to start from agency and then transition into um, a client side, perhaps go back to, to agency, or to start with client side, what, what, looking at where the world is going today, is there a path that I, is ideal? I, I don't think there's an ideal yeah. path. I think what uh, job seekers need to think about is um, gaining depth in their capabilities. So what we see a lot, I mean, in the last um, five years, I think I've hired like 50 people. Mm -hmm. And what I, I used to see a lot is people are in one role for a year, yeah. or a year and a half, then they move to the next role and next role. You think you're doing yourself Absolutely. service, eh? because you're getting a little increment every time you move. But let me tell you, the depth of your marketing is very shallow. Because now when you start mm. going deeper, because it takes at least three years for you, the first year actually even understanding the organization or the agency you work with or the clients you're working with. The next year now you're, you know, by the time you're in year three is when now you're, you're at expert level. At Diageo we have different, we, we classify marketing in different mastery levels. So there's beginner, you know, intermediate, yes. something, advanced, master. Now you're the master of that specific area here. It takes a minimum three years to get to that mastery. But what is happening in this industry? People are jumping. So by the time you're coming to me for an interview and I'm asking you, you know, strategic questions right. that you should know, it's so shallow. Mm. Yeah. I like I like what Odera <clears throat> said because, um, and there's a reason why the industry is like that, because to can this point, the skill set is also lacking. So I'll give an example like, uh, you know, what I've been doing for the last you know, couple of years has been really focusing on clients' business performance, but really powered by technology through digital marketing. Right? Um, and what tends to happen is that we have a specific role called the performance digital media buyer, which is a very unique skill set within marketing that requires you to not just learn, you also need to practice. Right. And at least practice for two years yeah. over time. Yeah, like you really have to get that yeah. craft right. What tends to happen is that you find someone coming in at entry level, they get trained up, and then a year and a half later, they're out. They're out. Where, oh, we've gotten a director position in another company. And you, you keep on asking yourself, like, you know, what's really happening here? Yeah. It's because there's a gap in the market, and so everyone is just trying to grab whatever they get. What tends to happen is that it will reach a point where the talent plateaus, 
because there is a lack of in-depth yes. specialization yes. and just you know people understanding that you, know, you need to do your time yeah. people never oh. get this notion of you actually do need yeah. to do time mm. and then the flip side of that story yeah. is then the people who hired that person, who's an entry-level person as a director, yeah. are frustrated yes. because this person is not delivering. Yeah. And then they're like, this marketing doesn't work. And marketing doesn't work, and that's it. A flower. So now that person becomes the person in the corner for just update our posts. Yeah. Right? Yet they should be delivering strategic value for the business. So I think there's also um, a job to be done. In, in And I like what you said. First, because you know, the, especially because of digital, a lot of the rules have been evolving. Right. So there's need to really kind of clarify, you know, what are the rules, right? And what are the, what are the capabilities? What are the, you know, what are the JDs yeah. that, and, uh, that are needed at an SME level, at a, for yeah. a bigger, at different levels of the business? Yeah. And then even for you, HR people and people who are in recruitment, mm. you need to work with marketing people to define what that is and position. Because some of the things Joel and I laugh about because we're in all these forums together, mm. is somebody puts a JD and they're like, I'm looking for a social, social media, media manager, manager with 10 years experience. <laughs> and, or, you know, no, no, they want a, 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 someone to do marketing. Yeah. Uh, they're going to pay them 100K. They want 10 years experience and they want them to do strategic, I don't know what. And you're like, there's a big mismatch between your expectations and what you're willing to invest yes, in. Yes. Because you have to always match the investment you're willing to make in the talent and the outcome that you're looking for. Yeah. Which is interesting because again, from a business leader standpoint, I am, I am an SME, I'm an MSME. At what point do I unlock what roles? Yeah. At what point do I outsource? Or should I just have it in source? What would your advice be in terms of mapping that out? Do they need to work with a consultant to figure that out? Can they just research it online? What's the approach? Let me share our experience when I was at KBL. Right. Um, so we outsourced all our creative media PR to the agencies. And we did that because, you know, they say um, outsource what you can't do internally well or, which is, or what's going to just, you know, take away from your core yeah. core. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we do that. Um, then over time, just pre-pandemic, we, when we started doing a lot more digital marketing, we realized there was a gap really on our side where maybe we didn't understand it too well. And so the output, so our briefs were not great. So our output was not great and you can't blame the agency. So we decided that maybe this is an element we need to insource so that we can also, for our brand and marketing managers, they can grow that capability in digital marketing that is so important. Right. right now, Kenya, right now, if I, I think about the um, media investment, Kenya spends about 60% of its media investment on digital, yeah. yeah, which is huge. Five years ago, it was probably 10%. So we, we insource the digital creative side of it so that also the marketing teams can benefit from learning and understanding digital. And then also because the way, the way digital is, it's always, you know, um, it's ever changing. Yeah. We want uh, to be able to have a lot of the team, internal team, the, the, the in-source team has a lot of autonomy to make decisions really on the fly, but with the brand at the, you know, at the core, not, mm -hmm. you're not just saying, let's post this and this against the brand guidelines. It's not what the brand is trying to do, but they understand the brand so well. They're like, this is going to work online. Let's do this today. Yeah. Versus when it's outsourced, where now there's a lot of, you know, there's not, it's not very efficient in yeah. trying to get things yeah. done. Yeah. That's the only reason. We still outsource core creative work, big creative ideas. We still outsource PR, media, etc. But that particular area, we've decided to insource. And right. it's working for now. Now, look, maybe in a few years' time, we'll be like, we don't need it in, 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 in sourced. We'll outsource again. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the organization. Yeah. What works for you at yeah. that moment in time. And having... Uh, leadership team or HR team who also uh, are dynamic or agile in that sense. Because imagine having that conversation with HR saying, I want to hire 40 people to sit inside the company. They look at you like, what? Yeah, headcounts. Yeah, yeah. Head yeah. Counts, yeah. Head counts, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think also, I think well, <laughs> and I worked on, <laughs> 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 we've been through a lot when I was at Safaricom and 
the same thing. So first number one, it starts from what's your business objective, Yes. Yeah. right? What are you trying to do as a business? So at Safaricom at that point, and again, it was because a huge chunk of our money is going into media and is going into digital. Yeah. Right. So when we're looking about what, and, and in sourcing models, there's different ones. You can have, we, which we have, we have people like from Joel's agency just coming and sitting full time with us. Yeah. Yeah. So that means they're not even part of like your headcount and right. anything, but yes. you just, they just sit there and they are part of the team. And that makes a big difference because the way they think, what they see, yes. they are part of the business. They understand the tensions of the business right. and they are close enough to be able to give you that skill. But then they're also connected to their agency, agency so that for their craft, they right. still benefit and they're still growing. Because another uh, problem, I think, is if you have people just sitting there and then they're not getting, their cup is not being filled. Yeah. Right? So there's that model. Then the other model which we ended up um, getting into is we said, okay, fine. Digital media is something we, we think is growing. We're spending a lot more money. It's a capability we need to build in-house. Right. So we actually hired people. Again, from the agents, and we'll talk about we'll talk about poaching uh, shortly. But we actually hired people and said, "Come, bring this skill. Let them sit in." So they were sitting in my team, right? And the, exactly what you're saying. First, they helped, you know, build the capability within the team. But then also, that's something now that you're starting to build. And, and especially talking about performance marketing, trying to see how you're optimizing and, and doing things on a daily basis. Yes. It makes sense to have that skill based on the business objective. Yeah, yes. Then from an agency perspective, what we worked on, and, and I think Dense was really flexible and agile in that sense. And that's also what you need. You need partners who yeah. understand where yeah. you're going and they, they adjust themselves to, to that. Is we said, okay, fine, let the strategy will still sit with them. Right, and this piece now just became executional. Yeah. So again, it's a real continuous partnership of saying, okay, so what are these guys doing? What are we doing? And how are we making sure that we're all, everyone is doing their part yeah. to deliver on the outcome? Okay. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, <clears throat> what I got to appreciate, and first and foremost, like these ladies who are sitting, uh, you know, having these discussions here, have been true titans in the industry who have been willing to listen and to make changes and to evolve, which is really the very definition of intelligence. Hey. Ah. Okay. Yeah. So he just called us titans. Yeah. An intelligent, intelligent, intelligent titans. <laughs> I, mean. okay. I, am so, I want that clip. <laughs> that's, that's just that clip. Well, the reason why I say this is because in 2018, while Guadera was at Coca-Cola, we did have this conversation, right? right? What people don't realize is that the person who replaced Waidera when she went to EABL was actually the person who she worked with from yeah. the agency on yeah. our side. Yeah. Uh, when I started working with Kendi, it was the same reality. And I, I remember with Kendi, we started having conversations around what is it that the agency can fix within the business, you know, meaning that our teams would sit in there and actually like get immersed within the brand be quote unquote part and parcel of that team and, and as a result of that they get the, the depth. The reason why you need to fix talent is that they will be part and parcel of the organization. They already have the breadth. Yeah. You just need them to get the depth. Yeah. Right? right. Um, and then you flex where we would have needs. So for example, you're not always going to require a digital transformational strategist to come and sit within an organization to understand what lifetime value models the business needs to build over mm -hmm. time. That's something that the agency can, can flex on. Yes. And they will only be plugged in once now. When it comes to sustainability, for example, mm -hmm. um, and you know, working towards um, you know, sustainability, sustainable models of, of, of running your marketing campaigns, that's not something that should require someone to come in 100%, yes. you know, they'll just flex. So we started working on this flex fix and flex model mm -hmm. that you know works really well and so we need to upside think we can carry the same yeah. practice. Yeah. So you know those are some of the things that that's why I say the ladies who are here, they're titans. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And they're willing yeah. to make changes where changes. Right I'm only hangs out titans. <laughs> <laughs> so let me paint a picture uh, first of all for the audience. Joe, Candy, where they right are you all are you struggling to find talent? Yes. <laughs> Have you struggled to find talent? Yeah. Have you struggled to find talent? Always on the for talent. <laughs> All right. So just to give you a sense, uh, we, uh, as I was telling you earlier, our marketing functions happen to be the top three uh, in terms of listings on our platform in the country. So we get a, a huge volume of seekers who claim to have marketing experience. However, we only have 2,000 listings in the year. So maybe about 100,000 seekers wow. and only 2,000 listings. Okay. All right. So assuming all the 2,000 jobs are filled, 
there's a whole 98,000 young people who are not got a job. So there's a huge demand. Yeah. The thing is, they are competing for these little opportunities. And still, the three of you are saying you struggle to find talent. So that's the first picture. Second picture is, I would like to just read a list of titles that I've come across in my research. Media Futures. Yes, <laughs> <my> era. <laughs> Content Marketing. Growth Marketing. Marketing Automation Specialist. Social Media Strategist. Customer Experience Specialist. You spoke about that. MarTech. Brand Storyteller. Community Manager. Trade Marketing. Product Marketing. Public Relations. That's just... Uh, my wife is Kikuyu, so she... she <laughs> 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 so, uh, so the question is, what's going on? Why do we have all these job titles? If I'm confused, the seekers are confused, the CEOs are confused, HR is super confused. Help us navigate this. How, how does a business leader decide what role they need? How does an, a seeker align themselves to be able to meet your demands? ETC, ETC. Do you want to take a stab at this? What is the future? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe let's start there. <laughs> um, so it, it goes back to when we're saying marketing is the strategic engine of a business. So one of the things you need to do when you're building your strategy is have a forecast. So you, your strategy is not just for a year. Maybe you have a three-year or five-year strategy. In that five-year strategy, you're looking at, okay, maybe we're saying we want to shift from mainstream to premium, or we want to shift from this to this. We want to do, uh, go into other channels like e-commerce or whatever in the next two, three, five years. So you now need to start looking at your workforce and saying, do I either upskill my current workforce or are these actually new roles? And then if you think about marketing, yes, you can be a general marketer, you can be a brand manager, marketing manager. But what we are seeing and from the roles you've actually called out in the last 10, 15, 20 years is specialization. Okay, so Media Futures is a specialist um, function in marketing that deals with anything that's next. What's next in media? How do I connect with consumers tomorrow? Yeah, so you have to decide, okay, these specialist roles, are they the ones that are going to help me deliver on my strategy? Then let me, you know, let me allow for the headcount and let me. If you look at my, the team I, I run across Africa, all specialist roles. So we have a performance manager in-house, we have a content lead, we have a data lead, we have, you know, and why do we have, because we've looked at our five-year strategy and said, for us to evolve or connect with our consumers better, we need to really digitize and transform our business. And these are the roles that can help us get there. Yeah, so that's the approach we take. And then the question is then, um, as a seeker, you're struggling to find the talent. How do I position myself, uh, myself to be able to take on these roles? Because ch- what how it looks like is I'll offer you five five uh, profiles. You tell me none of them meet the criteria. Mm. I'd like them to understand what it is that you're looking for, or perhaps because there's all these variations, what do they need to start looking into their profiles to to I guess correct mm. or the skill. What skill sets do they need to be building? So I think first. And, and I think there's the, the basic notion around there are some things that fundamentally don't change. And then there are the things that change, right, when it comes to skill sets. So I think first, even for seekers, they need to understand, again, ba- back to this whole basic understanding of your role is to deliver commercial value. So yes. that whole understanding of do you understand how what you're doing is delivering to the business objective? That's sort of a fundamental. Whether you're doing growth marketing, whether you're a social media manager, you have to understand that. So that's a basic fundamental. Then once you've understood the basic commercial fundamentals, then from there you specialize because now you become the expert yeah. into saying, how can I leverage social media to deliver growth? So I feel like the biggest um, uh, feedback I would give to most of most of uh, job seekers is to say, do you understand the, you know, it's like a house. I keep saying houses, but the foundation of yeah. the house is that commercial understanding. And then you're able to articulate how being a specialist in this area is helping deliver that. Because right. that's the only way now you start to link back. Because I feel like the problem is most of them, I'm like, great, I'm, you know, and then people also hiring like that. Mm. You see somebody as, I don't know how many, like Joel, is a socialite. He has very many followers on Instagram, mm. right? But d- those followers on Instagram, 
do you know how to commercialize that? Yeah. Yeah. If you're not able to commercialize, you'll just go gather. You have a Facebook page there and you have 10,000 people. But how are you deriving value from that following? So that, for me, I think is one of the biggest opportunities there is to say, first, from a job when you're hiring, how well do you understand what you're looking for? Yeah. How does that growth hacker or social media and community manager, how is that linking back to my objectives? And then, then therefore, you can actually choose and select the people who are able to do that for you. So we have a, so we have a variety. Uh -huh. Largely zero to two years to, to seven years experience, right? Okay. These are people who perhaps have worked for an SME or have worked first job. The first job okay. Have worked sometimes in, in, in some of the large corporates. And then there's all these new roles emerging, like I said. And we will shortlist them, but then the question is, they're missing that one element, okay. that specialization that, that yes. the client is looking for. Um, Kendi and I were speaking about a PR manager and and about another marketing manager position that, that loaded everything on it. <laughs> so it's so the market is shifting quickly. So the clients are asking for all sorts of specialist roles. Okay. At the same time, the seekers are not moving as fast. So that's that's our observation that there's a speed that the industry is moving at and the seekers are not adapting to. Okay. So for starters, and thank you so much for that clarification. For starters, I think one of the things that I think seekers can start looking at is maybe this is your first role uh, within a business or looking to you know get into the next level within your career, you're within that two to seven year bracket that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there are very many free uh, resources that you actually get training from, especially from digital marketing. Yeah. Uh, you know, skills shop that's yeah. provided by Google is a totally free resource that anyone can actually go and get. And it's a great basis to start off from. Right. Um, you know, there are other uh, certifications that you can get. Yeah. And, you know, I know Kendi will speak a bit about that. Um, I think that those uh, aspects around specialization that you can actually go and get, um, it, your knowledge, the how-to. Um, when I was in university, I remember my lecturer, when I was just starting undergrad, he told he was telling us that, you know, the education so far has taught you how. Mm -hmm. Up until undergrad, you're being taught how. Mm -hmm. Onwards, you're going to be taught why. Mm -hmm. Why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, with the crop of graduates that we've been getting, even people who've been in, in, in uh, in employment, uh, you know, within that two to seven year gap, yeah. they are still doing the how yes. and then not really understanding the why. And I think if you start understanding why I'm doing what I'm doing to drive business growth, when you answer that question, why I think it becomes easier. So for me, it would be an urge to the seekers to really understand the why yeah. they are where they are and get that going for them and, and just drive it. It's, 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 a, it's something that I've always encouraged. Yeah. On the flip side, there's another lot of people I engage with, marketing directors, mm -hmm. who are now called CMOs, mm -hmm. new titles. Um, and also in that case, when I'm looking for a CMO for Safaricom, there's probably 40 amazing marketing directors in the country. I was helping ABL as well look for a marketing director the other day. Did you find one? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the so there's, there's challenges. There's challenges in finding talent at that level as well. And the question is, what is it that these marketing managers who are aspiring, and even the heads of marketing who are aspiring for the marketing director role, there's a piece that's missing. And we were talking about this with Kendi. There's the classical marketer. There's this modern day marketer who needs to be leading a Safaricom, a Diageo, to the, the future. Any comments around that and then what your, what your observations have been? You working with these marketing directors as a customer, you guys sitting in-house as the mm. heads of your organization. You know, it goes back to what I said earlier about depth. Time spent is so important. Mm. I'll give you my own personal example. My first job out of uni, it was a telco in America. <laughs> <laughs> So heavy but it, it was it was such an entry Kendi, it, level. It's just you and I who went to share that. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting for the right opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We'll, I'm we'll, like, I'm just looking for the we'll, opportunity. We'll, we'll throw it in. We'll throw it in. 
So we can't um, be left behind. My first job, and I remember I was recruited at a recruitment fair. It was very entry level, um, AT and T, and I ended up staying there for six years. And the reason why I did that in those six years, I had, I was promoted. I think almost every six months. And the, my advice, based you know, for job seekers is that first job you get into might not be the ideal job you want. Let me tell you, I hated my my first job. I'm like, why? What is this I'm doing? I went to university to do this. But let me tell you, that thing opened up because now I started learning. And like you said, the, the, the skill set, upskilling myself. So when another role came, I'm like, actually, I have that skill set. Then I'm taken to that role. And then next, by the time I was leaving, I was managing a team of 20 people. You know, I was a mid-level manager. And this is at, in my 20s. Yeah. So I invested the time in that organization because also I saw the organization will help me grow and progress my career. Like I said earlier, stop job, hunt, whatever, what is it? Skipping from job to job to job because you're like, this is not the ideal job. I've seen that one there. But then you're only there for a year, two years. By the time you're going to the other job, the, that's why the, the pool of marketing directors in Kenya is very shallow mm. because we do not have those guys who've done the time, yeah. the depth, you know, and all that. So mm. I would say your first job, Try and get a lot out of it. You know, stay there minimum three years. Your next job, stay there again. And then you're also learning what you like or what you're good at, what your strengths are. And then saying, okay, let me sharpen my skills in this area. For me, I didn't start out as a digital expert, mm. you know. Eventually, I'm like, actually, I kind of get this thing. I like ambiguity. I like learning new things. So let me venture into digital. You know, we're talking about, you know, even what do you hire? Um... You know, I, I started doing e-commerce. Uh, Joel used to mentor me on e-com. And then eventually, you know, e-com blew up for us at EABL. And then we we're fortunate where we could put in a business case and say, we actually now need a, an e-com manager. And we did hire a whole e-com team. But if I hadn't done that, where I'm constantly upskilling myself, you know, you're also actually just growing yourself and progressing. And that's, that's the case. Right now, the, even that role that I, I left, Media Futures, is still vacant. Yeah, because you're struggling. Mm. A year, a year, uh, year later. And a, half, a year and a half later. Yeah, yeah. And I think also, just to add on to that, because I think that thing of, and this is at all levels, right? But especially because you mentioned that CMO, marketing director, is, yes. again, you have to take initiative to develop yourself. Yeah. yeah. Right? The, the, this thing of, you have to, the, the, the industry and the landscape is changing so fast mm. that we would be redundant if, if we were stuck in what marketing was when we started working 20 years ago, yeah, right? Good. Everything has changed. Yeah. So the importance and the need of constantly upskilling yourself, go to all these, they're all, Meta has a whole uh, training yeah. a, yes. a platform, is certification, Google, all these guys, and they're free. Literally, you just need to spend time and go LinkedIn learning, there's a whole, yeah. you know, there's so much, mm -hmm. it's such a good time to be alive. I keep saying that. If you compare when we were growing, when we were in our careers up those 20 years ago, for you to get a training, you had to go to a classroom, you had to be part of, you know. But and right pay now, a lot of money. Pay a lot of money. Yeah. Right now, first, I think there's a lot of free training. But then also you need to invest in yourself. You know, I remember for me, one of the things, and Joel again, has been very instrumental in this journey, is I said one of the things that I'm going to be doing to invest in myself as a marketing director or a CMO is go to Cannes. Because when you go to places, it's about what are the things that you're doing that will open your mind. So you see, oh my God, this is the world that exists out here. What are the things you're investing in? Once a year, twice a year, they, you have to be making an investment in building your craft. Absolutely. Yeah, at whatever level you are. Because if you don't do that, you will be left behind. Even locally, the MSK, MSK, Marketing Society yeah. of Kenya. I think we've all been part of, you know, the MSK. Board, yeah. the, the award, she was a chief judge one time. I mean, then you're exposed to a lot of work. Just locally, yeah. start with local. MSK, you MSK, know. Yeah, but yeah. you just have to invest. I think what I'm saying is it's an investment. I know. It takes time and money that you get out of us. I feel like yeah. most, of, most of us are so comfortable in, in what HR is doing for us. Yes. Right? And what the HR people are going to give me. Mm -hmm. right? Versus actually just opening yourself up to the industry and yeah. saying, well, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I just felt like there's more to be done at an industry level. Right. We can do great things in our different organizations. But unless we start to see what are the things that we need to do to collaborate more at an industry level, and right. skills and capability building is one of the areas right. that's a real pain point right yeah. now. How can we do that? Work together to literally start to, to, to make sure that this skilling is right. People understand what skills are required. There is a way for them to get those skills. Then now the quality of work and the outputs will be much better. So please plug okay. that properly. That is what CK marketing and coaching is going to be doing. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Allow me to just find on that. Yeah. You know, 
what the Tula Millennials are doing. Um, now we are lovely. Lovely, <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely <laughs> titan, <laughs> intelligent. <laughs> this is why you are our friend. Continue. You know? Positivity. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep taking you places we'll with us. Uh -huh. yeah. Here's the thing. Um, a couple of years ago, I remember challenging the way they write challenge Kenya. We need to get out of Kenya, we need to get out of Kenya because um, I felt that advertising was becoming boring. Mm. Um, and marketing had just become, you know, what was, I feel like there's a change that's happening right now, like a genuine change. And one of, um, you know, one of you know, the big creative directors who works for competition actually brought it up in a, in a forum that we were having, where he said that, you know, uh, we need to bring the joy back in advertising. Mm. Because, to be honest with you, it's one of, the joyful careers that you can easily get to learn from. If you look at products that you know Nike has been able to put out, Apple, yeah. it all started from a marketing perspective, where the product was right, the price was right, the distribution was right, and when you did the marketing, it's just like a full circle experience, mm -hmm. right? So the reason why we see that there's a lack of talent is because I don't think people realize that there's actually joy in <laughs> doing the work that we do. Mm. There's, there's an excitement, there is, a, for me to be able to come up with ideas that scare why there are, it's not scaring her, you know, to not do the work, it's scaring her because it's the excitement and the risk mm. that you take. You actually need to get comfortable being in your discomfort zone, yeah. if it makes sense. Yeah. Mm. And that's something that we really need to push, you know, as much as possible. It's interesting. And I, I mean, I, I wish we had more time, but lately there's been a lot of uncomfortable marketing going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps, Joel, you can tell us what's going on in the background. Is, is it that we're trying to shock, shock therapy on our customers? Is it a strategy that people are employing? I'm just curious, that's just totally out of this. I think it's a mix of everything, like there's brilliant work that's out there, there's shocking work that's out there, that gets people talking. Yeah. At the end of the day, the question is like, you know, what was the thought process behind that? And I don't really mention that yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, um, but I think the more you immerse yourself, even within the, the depth of, of marketing and getting to understand like, you know, what it takes to actually come up with a creative idea that would actually grow a brand ultimately and return the investment that yeah. the business has put yeah. in. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot, yeah. but I think we need to move away from that. And I don't want to say safe space where we are now doing like very risque, yeah. you know, advertising. I think yeah. it's brilliant work that actually needs to be done. Yeah, and I just have to comment because this is also one of my. <laughs> I'm usually that person in those groups yeah. <laughs> saying, <Why>? what? <laughs> I think also, the, so as much as, and, we, and, and as much as we're talking about um, marketing and brand building for the business, yeah, there's also a whole thing around ethical marketing. Yes. And back to the why yeah. we do it. And, you know, one of the things I think, again, that we need to re reignite is that, is, is marketing and brand building should be a force for good. Mm. Yeah, it should be something that, is leaving the society and the community better. You know, yeah. one of the things, I, I have a 13 year old, and most of the time when I look at advertising, when I look at content, the lens I look at is how is this making, shaping this person for the better? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that for me is the tension. You know, I mean, there's a couple of uh, initiatives, and maybe this is a call to action <laughs> uh, for us. <laughs> We've been talking about the Stereotype Alliance, and that's a really good um, mm, yes. movement that's really, a, that helps even build the awareness within the industry about how can we make sure that everything we do advertising is a force for good, right? Because at the end of the day, we advertising, we shape perceptions, we shape culture. We talked yeah. about culture earlier and how we tapping into the good side of it so that we're not, we're not uh, enabling negativity in the society and in the community. So that's also a balance. And I think that's part of, part of what that debate has been about. Yeah. yeah, you can get something. Okay. It gets you the attention. It gets you the, the, the people, people try, people talk even they try, you get the sales. People yes. go to the supermarket and all of a sudden they picked you. The but have, has that campaign actually left this society better mm. or not? That's very mm. powerful. 
So guys, believe it or not, uh, time goes by very fast when you're having fun. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I hope you are. But, but I wanted to comment on culture. Yeah. She's yeah. having too much of it. Because, yeah, I am. And I need to... <laughs> You know, one of the big aha moments for me when I joined ABL, I uh, was working on Tasca, big brand, you know, national heritage. But pa Tasca was ailing, to be quite honest. Declining. Declining brand equity. You were there. And that was after you guys killed Tasca Project. In. But anyway, well. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So, but let's just. And, 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 when, we, and when I look back, um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, Tasca doesn't need to be promoted or marketed. It needed to be. And, but the problem then was we were blasting advertising at consumers, you know, in a big brand way. And it's, it's such a humble lesson because now when we finally sat back and understood the consumer um, and even brought people into the fold, the, the, the in-house team, who are the younger consumer who actually were targeting, were like, what does this brand mean for you? And they told us, honestly, it's for our dad, it's for our uncles, it's an old brand. And we're like, hey. And that's when we decided we have to put Tusca back into culture. Right. Now, putting a brand into culture is not about it being a fad or a trend or, you know, that's fast culture. I'm talking about slow culture. Mm -hmm. How are you actually impacting the society that you're in, giving you a social license to operate? Mm -hmm. That is what you know, brand building from a culture, in culture perspective is supposed to be. So you as a marketer, or if you're looking for a job, how are you even thinking about, you know, putting brands in culture, brand building, not just from a short term, a long term perspective. Yeah. And I think that was my aha moment. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, and credit to the, to the Tasker team and the wider ABL team around this is because this whole thing of, you know, using market share year on year mm. was such a pain in the wrong places. Mm. It was such a pain. I mean, when we took over the business, we found it that way. It was still going that direction. And it was up until the pandemic, actually. 22. 22. 22 mm. uh, is when I think there was a radical shift in the thought process mm. that we said, you know, the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And the need for us to actually inject new talent, new thinking. Uh, I remember that's where even the Nexters yeah. program came in, where we are looking at what what does the next generation look like? Yeah. And what is a brand gonna what, leave what, for? What what, what yeah. does the brand mean? Not for me. I'm like I'm fairly young, mm. but for the people who are younger. Than me, are you young I'm anymore? Young. You're not young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, long story short, I think. More importantly, um, as we think about the, the role of advertising and marketing and culture, um, is we, we are beginning to see creators coming in also and playing a very big role in that. You know, we, we have new positions now within the agency where you're not just a, 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 an influencer manager, you're a culture curator. You actually do have your finger on the pulse of culture with whatever is happening on social. Um, you know, you are creating work that actually entertains and mm. educates, mm. and hence entertainment then becomes a whole thing altogether. Mm. So I think it's really interesting to see that evolution coming into play. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting times. I think what's sad is that we could go down each of those paths and uh, we don't have enough time. Um, perhaps a different setting, uh, <coughs> lighting, um, but um, at a later time. At a later time. Um, so, <laughs> What I'd suggest, if you don't mind, is just give us a glimpse as to what you're seeing is likely to come in the next one or two years. There's no one who can tell us what's coming in five years. Um, but what you're seeing and from your, where you're sitting, perhaps what the seekers, employers need to be looking out for as we, as we wrap up. Um, and then we'll call it a day. Perhaps you can start with you. Okay. So, uh, this sort of points to the fact that really revolves around the customer, but what the role of future employers need to look like. Um, there was a study that was done uh, uh, last year, actually, whereby CEOs, including in Kenya, by the top CEOs, were asked, like, do you think uh, your company, your brand, your business um, is delivering great consumer experiences. The reason why a consumer will stay with you is because they are getting a great consumer experience. 81% oh. of them said, yes. We went and talked to these same, same consumers 
and you want to believe 7.8% of them said these brands are actually delivering great consumer experiences, great brand experiences for me, the consumer. You can already see where the gap is. Yeah. Right? Um, I think for businesses, there's a need for us to really, really, if we really want to grow our businesses, if we really want to make a profit, we have to have the customer at the center of what we are doing. And marketing plays a very, very critical role. Marketing is not a cost center, it's actually a revenue center. Mm -hmm. And the moment we start shifting our mindset to start thinking about the future of media, we need to fix the base first. Mm -hmm. By fixing the base, is changing our attitude towards what marketing does uh, within our businesses. And so reaching that right customer at the right time, at the right place, with the right message, becomes increasingly important to grow that lifetime value. So that would be my parting shot. Thank you. Thank you. I think, and I'm an eternal optimist, so let me just put a disclaimer. But I feel like for marketing and for the industry, it's, this, it's a really good time to be in marketing. It's a really good time to be doing what we do. Why? I think the internet is such an enabler on so many things. And this is because I always have the thing of when we started 20 years ago and now how life is. Before, um, you, put an, you had to create this major, mega production mm. to put all his life when we were doing Tusker Project fame. We had to deliver a TX copy to Citizen <laughs> by 3 p.m. for the show to air, right? <laughs> the, you know, I, I tell the young people I know now and they just look at me like, my God, are you old? But the truth is technology has created such, a, has, has leveled the playing field in such a way that a couple of things are happening. I think a lot more organizations are able to do great marketing. Mm. SMEs, you know, small organizations, all of a sudden now that's investment that is, that is there. So I think in the next two, three years, I see a lot more investment coming into the marketing space from a people perspective mm. and from a, a outputs perspective, which is a good thing. Then therefore, then the opportunity, and again, the, the job to be done is to see how do we make sure that we have the right capabilities at all the different levels to make sure that that investment is properly optimized. Yeah, because I feel like one of the biggest challenges, and I'm also going to reiterate, is marketing is an investment yeah. to drive your revenue from the people you put in into the into the money you spend into the market. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like there's a whole um, understanding that needs to happen so that from your CFO to your HRD, everybody understands why we have to invest this amount of money to get the outcomes that we need as a business. So it's not a nice to do. It's a critical driver of business. And that's sort of, I think, more and more. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with a lot of SMEs, such as yourself, where people are like, hey, we want this marketing thing to work first. So, so people have a hunch that it can work. Yes. But now, how do you make it now fundamentally something that actually demonstrates the value that it adds mm -hmm. so that the marketing teams are upskilled to the right level, they're delivering the right outcomes, and then the businesses are thriving and growing. Fantastic. My parting shot will be to job seekers. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you doing to, whether you're in your first job, or you're looking for a job, second, third, fifth, tenth job, doesn't matter. What are you doing to invest in yourself? It's so important. I, I, I know we said it before, but mm -hmm. I always tell um, my team or my mentees, first of all, you don't need to have, mentorship comes from any, like we said, anywhere. You could watch a TED Talk, that's your mentorship. You, yeah. could, you know what I mean? It's so amazing that you could reach out to somebody out there, a CMO that you admire, and you'll find them online and listen to them. Mm -hmm. That's it. So who are you surrounding yourself with or what are you surrounding yourself with? Then I always say, um, prepare yourself for the next job now. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, I didn't know anything about e -com. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what, this is, the business is going there. Mm -hmm. So I started surrounding, uh, Joel used to give me a lot of white papers and, you know, just reading about it, experimenting, learning, speaking to other e partners. What does this mean? Then the skill set came. So when the next job came, it was so automatic. Mm -hmm. Like, she knows e -com, let her do this role. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to prepare yourself for the next job today? Mm -hmm. And don't blame HR. Don't blame your line manager. Don't blame it. <laughs> Just take responsibility mm -hmm. and equip yourself so that only you can uh, progress your career. Amazing. Only you. You're in charge of yourself. Amazing. Yeah. So I'm going to attempt um, to summarize, but not, uh, not too well, I imagine, because we don't have that much time. But we've talked about developing yourself, which is like the first thing, right? You need to consistently develop yourself. You need to understand what your business needs. And then when you understand what your business needs, you will decide whether to insource, to outsource. Yeah. That tension will always be there, and it's good tension. Yeah. 
um, that marketing is a strategic function. Yes. Yeah, that marketing is not an dog to, to do what the sales team says, but truly, if well leveraged, is a revenue driver. Yeah. So thank you very much once again for being with us this morning. We're truly, truly honored. Um, like I said before, this podcast is our second podcast. We'll be continuing to do this across different functions. Um, this particular episode was sponsored and supported by CK Marketing and Coaching, Brighter Monday Kenya, and the Marketing Society of Kenya. We look forward to speaking with you more and more and going deep into these conversations to help you as a job seeker, you as a, an employer, you as a business owner to be better at doing what you do. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for you. having us.